The case today involves a 70-ish year old patient who was brought in by ambulance for shortness of breath. The patient was recently diagnosed with a pneumonia and empyema status post chest tube. The patient was in moderate respiratory distress. The vitals are as shown with a pulse of 75, respirations of 30, systolic blood pressure in the 80s, setting 98% on room air, and was afebrile. The EKG showed no evidence of ischemia. Due to the history of the patient's pneumonia with empyema, I decided to start with ultrasound of the lungs. The left diaphragm is shown here, and it shows no evidence of effusion. I have moved on to the right diaphragm and costophrenic angle, and you can see here a small effusion present. I felt like this size effusion should not be the cause of the patient's respiratory distress that I observed. I decided to perform a pocus echocardiogram. This is the parasternal long axis view. Notice that there is a circumferential pericardial effusion. There's also abnormal movement of the right ventricle, but we'll discuss this in a moment. I first wanted to compare the patient's true pericardial effusion seen over here to another patient's fat pad, which is a false positive for a pericardial effusion. Notice that the structure is only seen in the anterior aspect of the heart and not circumferential. And notice it is not completely anechoic, but rather has some echogenicity seen in it, indicating that this is a fat pad. Since we have observed that there's a pericardial effusion, we now want to identify if there's tamponade physiology present. So there are five signs of tamponade physiology that we use, going from the least specific to the most specific. The first will be a pericardial effusion. The second will be an enlarged or plethoric IVC. The third will be right atrial collapse. Then it goes to right ventricular diastolic collapse, which is highly specific. And then in the right setting where there's a pericardial effusion, sonographic pulses paradoxus will cinch the diagnosis. Going back to our parasternal long axis view, you'll notice that the RV free wall over here has abnormal movement. This is often referred to as a trampoline sign, but what is occurring here is that there is diastolic collapse of the right ventricle, which again is highly specific for tamponade physiology. This is the parasternal short axis view used to visualize the pericardial effusion. However, the right side of the heart is not well seen in this view. Now we have visualized the IVC as it courses through the liver. Notice that the IVC is quite large, greater than two centimeters, and does not vary with respiration. This is consistent with IVC plethora and is a very sensitive finding for tamponade physiology. However, it is not specific. We need more views. Now we have the last view, which is the apical four chamber view. We're gonna focus on the right side of the heart, specifically the right atrium, which is seen here. Notice that there is evidence of right atrial collapse, sometimes also referred to as inversion or scalloping, but there's a bending inward of the right atrium. Finally, we move to the most complex measurement for tamponade, which is sonographic pulses paradoxus. For this measurement, we again obtain an apical four chamber view and activate pulse wave Doppler. We'll place the sample gates at the tips of the mitral leaflets just on the ventricular side. This will measure blood flow coming from the left atrium into the left ventricle during diastole, which you can see over here. And the blood flow moving from the left atrium to the left ventricle is seen here with the E wave and A wave. We're not gonna go into diastology, but what we will measure is the peak velocity of the E wave seen here. And notice as the patient breathes, the E wave changes height. And now we can change, measure the speed of the E wave at its peak and at its trough. And you'll notice that there is approximately a 50% drop in the speed of the E wave as the patient breathes. If there is over a 25% drop of the mitral inflow velocity, that is consistent with sonographic pulses paradoxus. Notice I said tamponade physiology. Well, that's because the patient might not be hypotensive yet, and hypotension is required for the clinical diagnosis of cardiac tamponade. Our goal with POCUS is to find tamponade physiology before hypotension and true tamponade occur. As you can see from this graph, a patient can sustain a normal cardiac output for quite some time as the pericardial volume and pressures increase. But at some point, as the pericardial pressure increases, the cardiac output will rapidly drop off. Again, we want to identify tamponade physiology over here rather than when the decreased cardiac output has occurred. 
Finally, if the patient has had a cardiac arrest from their tamponade or you do not have a consultant to perform pericardiocentesis, POCUS can assist with the pericardiocentesis. The details of the procedure are outside of the scope of this video, but note that there are four potential spots for needle entry. I suggest that you utilize the area that has the greatest amount of pericardial fluid on ultrasound. There's a right and left parasternal space, there's a subxiphoid space, and there's an apical space. Going back to the case, the patient was taken to the cath lab emergently where approximately 700 cc's of serosanguinous fluid was removed and the patient's hypotension resolved. The patient was admitted afterwards and was discharged home a few days later.